Well, my name is uh, Alan Hertzke. I'm a professor here in political science at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, welcome to this webinar featuring my friend and colleague, uh, Mustafa Akio. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the Center for Midi Studies and the political science department here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, let me explain one feature of this webinar. Unlike a chat function, we're using a Q&A function. And if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll, you'll see a Q&A um, uh, tab there. So if you have questions as we're going along, uh, you can type a question in that Q&A. And at the end of Mustafa's talk, I will pose some of the questions to him. So let me um, uh, take a moment to introduce our speaker. Um, <clears throat> Mustafa Akio was educated in political science and history in Turkey, and he began a decade-long career as a national journalist and columnist in Turkey for some of its most prominent national outlets. Since then, he is, his work has gained international stature, and his columns continue to be featured regularly in outlets like the New York Times, the London Times, the Wall Street Journal, and others. Uh, currently, Mustafa Akio is, the, is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. He is the author of Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty in 2011, The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims in 2017, and the soon to be released book, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom and Tolerance, the subject of his talk today. Islam Without Extremes has been praised by the Financial Times as a forthright and elegant Muslim defense of freedom. It's been published in Turkish, Malay, Indonesian, and I guess unofficially in Urdu. Uh, <clears throat> Mustafa Akio is a a really a prominent global uh, public intellectual of the first order. And in fact, his TED talk on faith versus tradition in Islam has been watched by over 1.2 million viewers. So we are delighted to have him here with us today. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, the distinguished Mustafa Akil. Thank you so much, Ellen. That is very kind of you. Um, and it's an honor to hear these words from you. Uh, I wish I could come to University of Oklahoma like in the old days, you know, uh, physically, but this is the best we can do at the time of pandemic. And, and, and thanks for organizing this uh, online and uh, in such a short notice. And uh, also thanks to everybody for joining us today on the campus or from uh, different uh, parts of the world uh, to our conversation on my forthcoming book as you said, reopening Muslim minds, a return to reason, freedom and tolerance. Now, I'll try to explain what, what my book is about. I'll share some snippets of it, little insights, because, you know, if I tried to explain everything, it would take days and uh, that's not what I'm here to do. But uh, I want to tell what this is about. And let me begin with the very story, which is in the introduction, actually, chapter of the book. Uh, you refer to Malaysia, you know, my, my book has been published in Malaysia, that's true, but also it was banned in Malaysia and I got into trouble in Malaysia. And uh, let me tell how that happened and what is the bigger story that that experience actually revealed to me and that I tried to explain uh, in my book. Now, the, I've been to Malaysia, I think, six times over the past decade uh, with invitations from certain Islamic liberal leaning uh, organizations there, especially the Islamic Renaissance Front, which is a very small but very vocal and important organization. They are uh, founded by pious Malay Muslims who are trying to argue for human rights from freedom of conscience from an Islamic point of view against the more conservative forces in Malaysia that also have a very strong uh, grip on the official religious establishment. So in 2017, September, I was in actually Wellesley, Massachusetts, because I was a visiting fellow at, a, at the Wellesley College, at the Freedom Project at Wellesley College at the time. It was before my uh, join, me joining the Cato Institute. 
I was in Wellesley and I got this invitation to go to Malaysia again. And I said, it's the other end of the world, but I don't want to, uh, okay, say no. So I, I traveled from Wellesley to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and there were four events arranged for me for public uh, lectures by the Islamic Renaissance Front. And the first two of them went without any problem and they were welcomed by audiences. The third one was on a very sensitive topic. Uh, the title was, Does Freedom of Conscience Open the Floodgates of Apostasy? Now, what is apostasy? Apostasy is publicly renouncing your religion and choosing another religion or no faith. Like a Muslim becomes an apostate if he says, I'm a Christian now or an atheist. Uh, and you may think that this is a part of religious freedom. People can change their religion. It's in the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, to say the least. But not all Muslim authorities think like that because medieval Islamic jurisprudence, the four Sunni schools and the fifth the G uh, major school, the Shia Jafari school, they all considered apostasy as a crime. And the punishment was nothing minor. It was the death penalty. They only disagreed on whether the apostate should be you know, invited to return and how many days would be given, but apostasy was a crime punishable by death. And this is today, this medieval jurisprudential verdict in the interpretation of the Sharia, which is fiqh, uh, is not just in the books of fiqh with jurisprudence, but is also in the laws about, of about a dozen Muslim majority societies. Uh, that is like, if that includes Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan, and a few more. Now, Malaysia is decidedly a moderate country. So Malaysians say, we are very moderate. You know, we're not doing what the Saudis are doing. So they're not giving execution, uh, death penalty to apostates. What they do is to send them to rehabilitation centers. So in this public lecture in Kuala Lumpur, which is, you can find on the web, I gave like a 30 minute uh, speech where I said, listen, we don't want Muslims to leave their religion. As a fellow Muslims, I don't wanna see that. I don't condone that. I don't promote that. But if somebody loses faith in Islam, you cannot you know, force that person to come back. First of all, that would be hypocritical. That will not be through faith. Uh, second, uh, yes, apostasy was seen as a crime in medieval era by classical jurists because it was a different world. I mean, they considered apostasy also as crime against the state because your religious allegiance was also your allegiance to the state and it was a time of war. So they, they perceived apostate as potentially somebody join, leaving the Muslim armies and joining the enemy. That's why the Hanafis only gave it to males. I mean, the execution, not to females. That, that's a controversial reason, reason uh, argumentation, but I think it, it's, it makes sense. Uh, finally, I said, I refer to a Quran course, uh, a part of a Quran course, which probably every Muslim knows. La ikraha fi deen, or no compulsion in religion. That is actually a part, the beginning of a longer verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second uh, surah or chapter of the Quran. It reads, there's no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in God has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks. The, the, the small phrase in the beginning of that verse, there is no compulsion in religion, has actually become a motto of more liberal-minded Muslims in the past century at least. Uh, because it seems to show that religion should be based on no compulsion or, in other words, freedom. So I quoted uh, that verse in my speech as well. And finally, I said, listen, if people don't believe in religion, you cannot police it. Uh, because faith cannot be coerced from outside. It will be hypocritical. Religion is not something that you can police. Now, I said that. A lot of people applauded. You know, people were leaving. And then five or six serious men came in and they said, uh, are you Mustafa Kyol? They said, I said, yes. And they said, well, we are the religion police. So they showed me their identity cards and it writes on the uh, religion enforcement officer. That was their job definition. So they asked me questions and uh, who brought me to Malaysia? Why did I come? Did I get a tevliya or permission? And they said, did you quote La Ikraha Fiddin, no compulsion religion? I said, yes. What's the problem with that? 
uh, they said, okay, we will look into your talk and we will let you go. We will let you know. Uh, then they let me go that night. And the next morning I woke up in Kuala Lumpur and I read in the national media that I was hum summoned to the headquarters of the religion police to be questioned by a prosecutor. And my host said, you know, maybe it's a better idea to leave the country and deal with these legal issues from afar from a law through a lawyer. I followed that advice and I went to the uh, airport that night, Kuala Lumpur International Airport. But when I gave my passport to the <laughs> uh, passport security check, the female officer saw my name and she panicked and she called some other police officers. They called other police officers. So I was ultimately detained at that point. And uh, I was taken to the ultimately that night after a very long night and not a very good night, I should say. Uh, just stressful. I mean, they were not rude or violent or anything like that. They just did their job, but it was an unknowing, uh, si uh, stressful situation. Ultimately, I was arrested. I was detained and they said, you violated the law which bans teaching religion without permission from the authorities, which requires two years in jail. I was like, I was just going to my wife and kids and, uh, but you know, that was, that was the short, you know, future that I saw that night. Anyway, next morning I was taken to the court, the Sharia court, and I was questioned again for two hours who brought me, who abetted me, what was my intention, and why did I quote La Ikraf din no compulsion in religion. Ultimately, they let me go, and I appreciate that. You know, worse things happen to people in uh, countries that are not very liberal. Malaysia is, again, quite mild compared to other uh, episodes people go through in Saudi Arabia or Iran. Uh, so they let me go, but ultimately, they still banned my book, which was banned for three years, so we therefore put the Malay, uh, in, uh, Malay translation of the book for free download at the Cato Institute website, which I'm now a fellow working on Islam and modernity. But the point was, I was curious why they were unhappy or actually why they were not just unhappy, but they were disturbed by the fact that I quoted no compulsion in religion, which is a kind of very basic, well-known Quranic phrase. And I suspected, I said, maybe they differ in its interpretation. And I realized, yes, that's the case. Because I checked the website of Jakim, which is the official religious institute, institute in Malaysia. And I found there what I suspected, which is they translate la, no compulsion in religion with a little insertion into the worse. And let me show how it, that works. This is the only slide I will show in this talk. And here it is. Now, this is, do you see this, Ellen? Is the screen visible? I think, okay, Ellen doesn't hear me, but I think it's visible. So it's visible. Okay, great, thank you. So this is the verse I'm speaking about, the beginning of the verse. There shall be no compulsion in religion, or, or there is no compulsion in religion. But the Malaysian Jakim writes it a little bit differently. They write it this way. There shall be no compulsion in religion in becoming a Muslim. So in parentheses, they add a small detail there. Now, what is the difference between the, these two phrases, these two sentences? Well, when you say there is no compulsion in religion, it seems to suggest that, well, people are free in their religious practices. They can become Muslim. Maybe they can become an ex-Muslim. Uh, and when they are Muslim, you know, it's their conscience. You know, they can, they can do their prayers or fasting, their, their practices or their dress code and the way they deem fit. They deem fit is between them and God. So you seem to, you can, you can find those ideas there in this verdict. But when you say there shall be no compulsion in religion only while becoming a Muslim, which means, well, you're free to become a Muslim, but you're not free to leave the religion. And when you're inside the religion, when you're in the religion, you're actually subject to the authority of the religion police, which will make sure that you, know, you are an observant Muslim in the way that they, they define it. So this insertion into parentheses also takes place, of course, not just in Malaysia, but it happens in some Saudi translations as well. And I want to show you an example of that. Here is, uh, is uh, here's a translation of Quran into English uh, known as Sahih International, published in Saudi Arabia. And there you see a similar insertion there. There shall be no compulsion 
in acceptance of the religion. So the point is, well, you're not, you will not be forced to become a Muslim, but once you're a Muslim, you are subject to compulsion. You're subject to the authority of religious police, the authorities, and, and so on, so on and so forth. Now, I begin this story in, uh, I, I relate this story in the beginning of my book to, to just open up a broader discussion, because this is just a glimpse of a bigger problem I see in the contemporary Muslim world and in the Islamic tradition, at least the mainstream Islamic tradition. And that is an understanding of religion where really there is a reliance on coercive power. And that has been there from the beginning, uh, I think, of the Islamic tradition because Islam found power right at its beginning. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he passed away, uh, Muslims had a state in Medina, and then they started to expand that state. They built empires. Those empires were tolerant, mostly for their time compared to other alternatives. But they didn't see any problem in using coercive power. And as actually I explained in the book, that really grew over time. Uh, right there, you don't necessarily see blasphemy laws or apostasy laws, but they appear at some point as Islam becomes an empire and begins to do what empires at the time, like the Sassanid or Byzantine empires were doing, which also had blasphemy and apostasy laws. Uh, and and the, the, the understanding of Sharia, Islamic law built in that milieu is, uh, has, heavy, has a heavy dose of course of power. And when you bring it to the, today, it creates the problem what we what I call religious illiberalism that comes out in apostasy laws and other examples I will now try to explain a little bit. Now, I should say that at this point that this is a problem separate from violent extremism. Violent extremism in the sense of the, the terrorism perpetrated by groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS or Boko Haram, those groups are really, really extreme in the Muslim world. Overwhelming majority of Muslims do not agree with what they're doing, they condemn what they're doing. So we should be clear about that. We're not speaking about terrorism here. Uh, however, terrorism is not the only problem. There is the problem of religious illiberalism, especially compared to the standards of human rights that the world has achieved. And I will, towards the end, I'll come to whether, you know, we have the theological authority to actually make that comparison. Uh, so I believe this issue has to be honestly faced and discussed in, in the Islamic tradition, the interpreters of the Islamic tradition, the ulema, the scholars, need to take the Lockean step forward, as I call it. Why do I call it the Lockean step forward? Because the same problem was there in Christianity as well until the Enlightenment. And the change there came through philosophers like John Locke, who didn't oppose Christianity, just reinterpreted Christianity to oppose similarly illiberal doctrines of the time. Doctrines like divine rights of kings, doctrines like heretics should be punished, uh, doctrines like, you know, religion should be based on free conscience and should not be uh, dictated by the state. Doctrines like people have natural rights regardless of their religious affiliation. So that shift has happened in Christianity. And uh, at that time, actually, before the Enlightenment, before the era of John Locke, Christianity wasn't any more liberal than Islam. Actually, quite the contrary. At that time, the Islamic civilization looked much more lenient and tolerant. Uh, before Enlightenment, uh, it, there's no, it's not an accident that a lot of Jews migrated from Christendom to Muslim lands like the Ottoman Empire because uh, Muslims were actually more hospitable to Jews because they accepted Jews and Christians to be uh, Jews and Christians and live their religious traditions at a time when Europe was much more rigid. So that shift has happened in Christianity when Christianity had actually a, even a darker history of uh, religion, the, the fusion of religion with course of power. But that shift has not fully taken place. It has taken some place today in the Muslim world. When you go to Bosnia, you will not see Islam with course of power. But when you go to Saudi Arabia, when you go to Afghanistan, when you go to Pakistan, you will see a different, uh, different reality. You will see religion with, with coercive power. 
Uh, Mustafa, can I interrupt for a second and sure. have you end your screen share so we can see your- Oh, yes. I forgot to do face that. again. Okay, I forgot to do that part. Yes, thank you for reminding thank me. Thank you, very good. So what, what, what aspects of co coercion are we speaking about here? Well, one is the, of course, the issue of apostasy that I mentioned. Actually, there are maybe few apostates that are showing up in Muslim societies, but you see tales of people being jailed in like a pastor in Iran, like a blogger in Saudi Arabia, because they said something that the authorities considered as, uh, as apostasy. They sometimes openly committed, uh, chose another religion like Christianity, or what they said was considered uh, heretical, like uh, out of the line as kufr, as falling into unbelief. And it is also important that to note that the ban on apostasy is used not just to go after people who really abandon Islam, but just Muslims who actually merely think differently. Uh, because there are authorities who will say this statement is kufr, that is like falling into this belief. So even a Muslim who just has unorthodox views can be considered as apostate and targeted and executed. For example, in 1985 in Sudan, a prominent scholar named Mahmoud Taha was executed. He, he was called an apostate by the regime. Uh, he was just a scholar offering a new interpretation of the Quran. In Egypt, Nasr Abu Zaid, who just, again, offered the new understanding of the Quran by in, uh, insisting his Muslimness, his faith in Islam, was targeted and he had to leave his country. Uh, and there are other intellectuals in the Muslim world who recently has gone through this. And when you silence one scholar, one intellectual, you're actually not just dealing with, with you're not just violating the human rights of one person, but you're just closing a path that maybe open up minds in the Islamic tradition and in the Muslim world of today. So that's why I have a chapter on apostasy and I question the roots of this apostasy ban, which like other, most other injunctions that are coercive in Islamic law doesn't have any basis in the Quran, uh, but it comes from post-Quranic sources and without understanding the context of that post-Quranic environment. That's why Saudi or Malaysian authorities who believe in apostasy law insert parentheses into the Quranic verses like, like Rahafiddi. The other one is, the other issue on which I have another chapter is blasphemy. Blasphemy is, of course, a concept that comes from the Christian tradition. Uh, in Islam, the right word would be sab Allah or sab al rasul, which is insult of God or insult of the Prophet. Uh, and that is, again, considered as a crime punishable by death. Again, there is no basis in that in the Quran, but it is extracted from some tales narrated about Prophet Muhammad uh, ordering the execution of certain individuals in, in the latter part of his mission whether those stories really actually relate to blasphemy or whether those individuals were active enemies is a good question to consider on which I go through in my book. But this blasphemy ban has important consequences in the world today. Again, uh, you see human rights, serious human rights violations in some countries, in some Muslim majority countries where the blasphemy ban is applied through law. Pakistan is the most burning case. Uh, we recently had a, a panel, online panel at the Cato Institute, uh, where we had speakers, one speaker from Mar Marvi Sirmet, she's a human rights defender from Pakistan, and another expert who writes a recent a report on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. We spoke about what happens in Pakistan when you have a blasphemy law. Someone just who has a fight with a Christian neighbor can blame the Christian uh, neighbor for being, uh, for insulting a prophet. And the, the, the legal system will go after that person. And sometimes mobs, violent mobs, will go after that person. Uh, such was the case of Asya Bibi, who uh, was accused by co-workers on a farm uh, to have insulted Prophet Muhammad. She denied doing that. But she was in death row in solitary confinement for eight years uh, until she was finally released. But she had to flee Pakistan, and she had to go to, uh, go to flee uh, to find safe haven in Canada. And there are hundreds of similar cases in Pakistan. So we have a problem with blasphemy as well. Finally, there's another uh, issue on which I have a chapter and that's what we in the Islamic tradition call hispa, that is religious policing. Uh, it actually 
uh, I mean, people who look at this or people who will defend this idea will say it actually comes from Prophet Muhammad. He established the first Muhtasib. He, he founded, you know, the whole institution of Hizba. But uh, again, <laughs> in the relevant chapter, when I, I, I look at Hizba uh, and the person who does Hizba, which is religious policing, as it's understood today, is called Muhtasib. When, we, when you look at the life of Prophet Muhammad, uh, you see that indeed he established a police in Medina, but the point was to uh, prevent fraud in the market. So the Muhtasib, that institution was actually established as a, a police that prevents fraud in the marketplace, which gradually turned into and at least in encompassed religious policing as well. And uh, in the book, I also show how this transformation happened, why it happened, and why uh, this is a problem today. Of course, there are other uh, manifestations, of course, of religion today. One is patriarchy. There are teachings uh, espoused by traditional scholars, such as that you know men are dominant over women. Women should not be able to travel alone without a male guardian, without the permission of a male guardian. Uh, that's still an issue in, in Saudi Arabia in some Gulf countries. Actually, today there was a Human Rights Watch report published about how that works in Qatar, for example. And Qatar is a mild case, by the way. So there is the idea of there is an idea of male supremacy over women, or sometimes Muslim supremacy over non-Muslims, and these are in religious texts. Again, uh, not necessarily from the Quran, the only undisputed source of Islam, but from secondary sources. Uh, which I think should be understood through their historical context and sometimes their authenticity, I think, should be doubted and questioned, as I did in my book. Now, I said one thing. This is a problem separate from terrorism. I, I want to stress that. Uh, even conservative scholars who will defend some of these uh, illiberal bans on apostasy and blasphemy will renounce ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and they will still be law-abiding citizens, and that's good, and that's important, and we should emphasize that. However, we should also see that terrorists often take these coercive verdicts, just amplify them, and take them to more extreme levels. So there is a connection in that sense. For example, look at ISIS, how it was killing Shiites. It does still, I mean, ISIS militants bomb Shiite mosques in, 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 in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Uh, they do this by calling Shiites murtad, uh, apostates. Of course, mainstream scholars, conservative mainstream scholars will say that is unacceptable, that is wrong, you cannot re renounce fellow Muslims as apostates. That's good. But none of them will say no apostate ever should be targeted. Or look at uh, terrorist attacks in France uh, against cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo. Uh, the people who attacked them, Al-Qaeda, uh, owned some of those terrorist attacks, horrific attacks like Shuk France. And uh, there you see again the idea of punishing blasphemy taken to a vigilante level and practiced in the streets of France. Conservative scholars will tell you, no, 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 that's unacceptable because the blasphemy law should be properly given in a a court case and it cannot be implemented in a non-Muslim majority society, non-Muslim society. We have to uh, abide by the laws there. Again, that's valuable, that's important. But still the, I, the terrorists are relying on the verdict that blasphemy is a crime punishable by death. No wonder some of those conservative scholars will condemn ISIS al-Qaeda, that's great, but they will not necessarily oppose the blasphemy laws in Pakistan or, or Saudi Arabia. So we have an issue here. Now, people can ask, why is this a problem? You know, every religion has its own criteria. Every there, There's also that argument, like, nobody has to be like the West. And I'm not saying people like, uh, has to be like the West, because, and I'm not speaking about Western values here, but universal human rights, which has gained universal acceptance. Uh, why is this a problem? Well, as a Muslim, Thinking, living and thinking in the 21st century, I see that there are serious problems here for few reasons. First of all, well, this leads to the persecution of innocent people from Pakistan to Saudi Arabia, to Iran, to, to, to Nigeria. 
including critical Muslims. And that I think blocks the evolution of Islamic thought and tradition freely because without free discussion by religious policing and thought policing, any religion, any religious tradition or any thought tradition is going to stagnate and, and, and uh, deprive itself from the potential to grow. Second, this idea of coercing religion to be pious doesn't lead to piety. It leads to hypocrisy. I've seen that so many times. I've got on a flight in Riyadh and ended up in Istanbul. And I saw that, you know, half of the women who got on the flight in Riyadh with hijab and niqab ended up in Istanbul in quite revealing dresses. And it was obvious that they were not following the dictates of the religious police willingly. They just, they were not worshiping God. They were just trying to get rid of the police and, and, and its, and its uh, coercion. Now, now, of course, this doesn't mean that every Muslim woman who wears hijab or niqab is doing this for coercion. That's not certainly the case. And I think some people use that argument to sometimes ban hijab or niqab. And hijab is headscarf, niqab is face veil in Western societies such as France. And I'm against that as well. But ultimately, when you coerce people, it doesn't create piety, even if you achieve it, the appearance of that. It also leads to what John Locke said, the, divine, the contempt of his divine majesty, which means when you push people to be religious, well, you end up people actually running away from religion. There's a whole wave of ex-Muslims on the internet you can find. In Turkey, my country, the talk of the day is the rise of deism among Turkish youth. That is belief in God, but no religion, obviously an apostasy from Islam. And that is partly caused by this coercive, illiberal, uber conservative understanding of Islam, which is being showered onto Turkish society in the past decades under Turkey's current government and the allies of that government, let's say. Uh, and this also poisons the politics of Muslim societies. How? In most Muslim societies, go there, check Egypt. You will see people who are eager to implement the Sharia with the coercive rules that I'm de describing here, such as the Muslim Brotherhood. And they create a reaction and fear in the rest of society, which are exploited by relatively more secular autocrats, dictators who gain some credibility in the West and in their societies as the defenders of the society from the Islamists. I think the credibility given to those dictators is unjustified, certainly, because Islamist authoritarianism is wrong, secular authoritarianism is sim similarly wrong, sometimes even more violent and brutal. Uh, but Islamists, cre Islamists and their ambition to coerce religion and to claim religion in public uh, sphere with coercive method uh, creates such a anxiety in those societies, which ultimately helps uh, relatively more secular dictators. By the way, also, this course of understanding has elements that also help the autocratic rulers because they also, some of them, at least the Salafis, teach obedience to the ruler, which is a Muslim version of the divine rights of kings doctrine in, in medieval Christendom that John Locke you know, was arguing against. Finally, this adds to the problem in the West we call Islamophobia. Uh, now, there's no way to justify Islamophobia. I mean, the people we call Islamophobes are really hateful of Muslims of all persuasions. And, and they certainly have a very bleak view of Islam. They look at the darkest spots in the Muslim world to paint the rest in the darkest ways. And some of the Islamophobes, like fascists in the Balkans or some Hindu nationalists or white supremacists in the West, have a mindset which will make them hate Muslims no matter what. But also we should see that there is a genuine concern in, in, in some people from looking at outside to be worried about uh, the expansion and, and, and the potential of this course of understandings. As, if I'm not wrong, that's why I think uh, there were laws in Oklahoma to ban the Sharia, right? Well, I don't think Sharia will ever come to Oklahoma. So I think that that was a unnecessary move and the fears about creeping Sharia in that sense are quite exaggerated but it is coming from somewhere. It's coming from what some people do in the name of the Sharia in some Muslim majority societies. 
and what they claim to do even more. Now, why do we have this problem? Islamic tradition is also full of wisdom. Islamic tradition is full of compassion. Islam gives meanings to the lives of many people, including myself and my family. There are a lot of great things about Islam, but I think this, unless we solve this problem, those values will be curtailed. So we should speak about why we have this problem. And again, that brings me to the early marriage with power. Uh, and I think one thing we should understand, we should highlight there uh, by Muslims who are thinking about this issue is that Islamic tradition was formed under the tutelage and the influence of empires, empires like the Umayyad Empire and the Abbasid Empire and later other Muslim empires who had state-like <laughs> reactions and state-like ambitions, states do what they do. And that whole combination with the state led to the building of this course of religious tradition. We see this, for example, in the theory of abrogation. Uh, people familiar with the Islamic jurisprudence will know what I'm talking about. But abrogation, which was a theory of reading the Quran by early Muslims, early Muslim jurists, not all of them, but most of them, was the idea that there are different passages in the Quran that, and those passages are, some of them are about peace and tolerance and non-violence and non-coercion, just like the words I quoted, La Ikra Fiddin. There are other verses like, to you, your religion, to me, my religion. There are very powerful verses in the Quran that really emphasize that Muslims, all Muslims wanted, early Muslims wanted was religious freedom and freedom of speech uh, because Muslim Islam was born in Mecca as a civil faith. Prophet Muhammad was preaching monotheism and they just wanted to be able to preach their faith and also worship one God. That was not allowed by the pagans of Mecca. What would have allowed, what would have happened if they allowed is by the way, an interesting question, but uh, which I expanded in my book. But anyway, Muslims couldn't do that. And they ultimately migrated to Medina where they found political power. They founded a military and there were battles between the pagans, uh, the polytheists of Mecca and those battles are reflected in the Quran. Abrogation was the doctrine that the later verses, which emphasize war with the unbelievers, overrides and cancels the uh, earlier verses, the Meccan verses, that are about tolerance or freedom or uh, leniency, or just to you, your religion, to me, my religion, those kind of verses. Uh, and it's not an accident that the scholars who pushed for the abrogation doctrine were strongly allied with the Umayyad dynasty, Umayyad empire, which like all empires at the time wanted to expand. So, uh, and, and it's not an accident that the blasphemy and apostasy laws that took place under these empires, that grew under these empires, uh, was very similar to the Byzantine and Sassanid laws on, on blasphemy and apostasy. So it was the context of the time, which was not a very nice context looking from today's perspective. So I think my conviction is that we should be able to distinguish the theological fruits of Islam and the moral values from the political context in which they were revealed and in which they grew and in which they were interpreted. That context had a lot of patriarchy as well. We, we, we should be able to distinguish from our religion. Which brings to, which brings me to the uh, broader tradition called Islamic modernism. Uh, some of the arguments I'm making in the book, none of them are new arguments. I mean, there has been scholars since the 19th century. Uh, it began with scholars in the late Ottoman Empire and then Egypt and then in, in subcontinent, uh, people like Muhammad Abduh, you know, as a important, like a pivotal figure in Egypt they realize that something has gone wrong in Islamic tradition. They realize that there are some good values in the world out there, in the modern world, values like freedom of conscience, values like freedom of speech, rule of law, which they thought were actually grounded in Islam, which actually were compatible at least with Islam. But we had to reinterpret certain things and there were things in the tradition. Now this tradition began in the 19th century. It's, I mean, it's Islamic modernism, but it became a tradition in itself. And there are valuable scholars there, Fazul Rahman, for example, who 
by the way, couldn't survive in Pakistan, so he had to come to the US and teach at the University of Chicago. So there is this tradition of Islamic modernism, and I, in my book, borrow heavily from uh, the works of Islamic modernists on some contemporary issues. However, struggling with these issues for now 20 years at least, actually 30 if you really extend to my high school years, uh, I've come to realize that this is not just an issue of jurisprudence, that is the interpretation of the Sharia. There is a deeper level, and that is the theological level. And that is actually what my book is mostly about. Because here is a conundrum. When Islamic modernists, reformists, liberals are saying, well, there is this verse in the Quran, which is like Rafid Din, but there are other interpretations in jurisprudence that actually uh, go against that. So maybe we should re revise the way we understand tradition. We should reread texts. We should put them in their context. All these Islamic modernist arguments are doing one thing. Islamic modernists are looking into the contemporary world uh, accepting values like individual freedom, freedom of religion and speech, human rights, and then looking into tradition and then saying, okay, we can, when we understand things contextually, actually it will all fit. However, there is a theological dogma which will not allow that thinking in the first place. In other words, there's a theological rigidity which is exacerbated by cultural relativism or sometimes in anti-imperialism interpreted in that way, uh, which will say, we're not buying into any of this. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what does it mean? It's hawa, it is desire, it's just human passions. It doesn't mean anything. So there is a theological approach which wouldn't accept the legitimacy of any value beyond the text themselves. Uh, whereas I believe that God has spoken to us through religious texts, but also through human nature, through conscience and through reason. That's why when there's a tension between the two, it is legitimate to try to reconcile them. And that reason is universal. You know, it's not in just Islam, it's not just in Muslims, it's, it's, it's humanity, humanity's universal value. And that is, the most contentious points because a lot of people will say, no, 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 that is beyond the pale, that's unacceptable, or that is buying into hava or desire, and, and because anything beyond the text is, is for them illegitimate. Therefore, one thing I do in the book, which is actually the beginning, uh, that's why I refer to Haib Nyaksan, the great medieval story by Ibn Tufayl, the great Muslim philosopher. Then I look into Ibn Rushd, the great Muslim philosopher who's known for introducing Aristotle into Europe, but who also was a jurist. And I tried to look into how they were looking into the Sharia. And because they believed that God spoke to humanity through revelation, but also through reason, and reason is universal. So you can borrow ideas of Aristotle, even in a moral level, uh, and, you, and you can synthesize humanity. Ibn Rushd, for example, a little known fact, uh, wrote about in his commentary on Plato, he said there are uh, written laws of religion, but there are sunan gayr maktuba, which means sunan gayr maktuba, which means unwritten laws of humanity as well that are human nature. And today I think if we, I see universal human rights as the sunan gayr maktuba of today, the unwritten laws of human nature that humanity has through conscious established by a lot of terrible experiences. And uh, that is something Muslims should value and not, not deny. And then we can look back to our tradition and we can see messages that our medieval ancestors did not see. And that is only normal. Uh, I think it should not be forgotten that, for example, Christians uh, today justify separation of church and state very often by saying, Christ said, render unto Caesar, uh, Caesars and God to gods. And uh, they began to think like this in the era of enlightenment, medieval Islamic, uh, sorry, medieval Christian thinkers didn't think like that. So it's only normal that through human conscience, we develop values and, and those values allow us to look back into our religious texts. 
And I think that's what I mean by reopening Muslim minds. By meaning, what I mean is to reopen our minds, to look into humanity and to see the benefits of universalism. And I show how that worked in the Islamic tradition. Ultimately, as a Muslim, I'm proud of my faith. I'm proud of the values that has, my faith has given to me. But I'm sad about how those values have been curtailed uh, in the world today by rigid interpretations of the faiths that come from literalism, that come from bigotry, that come from also uh, just a effort to actually assert one's uh, culture and oneself against everybody else. And I, and I, I don't see there any value uh, and I remind that to my, uh, to my co-religionists that when Islam appeared in the world, it was a fascinating religion because it gave human rights to a society that didn't have human rights. Islam saved females from infanticide uh, in seventh century Arabia. So today to be able to do that, to advance our religious tradition in a way that inspires humanity, we have to do some rethinking and we have to face some of these problems in our religious tradition. And that's why I wrote this book. And thank you for uh, giving me this chance to speak about this. I will hope to hear from our audience uh, their, uh, their comments. Thank you very much. All right, well, <clears throat> thank you, Mustafa Akiol. It was wonderful. And we have a number of questions. So I'm going to... Um, address the questions and let you answer them. Um, and uh, there was a, the first question was kind of an extended meditation on how many see Islam as a book of rules versus a set of principles um, and wondering about, and also the difference between revelation uh, and law and wondering about is there, what kind of language or symbols can really kindle hearts for this more enlightened understanding? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's fair to say that if you want to make a, a comparison between religions, Islam is a religion that is a bit more similar to Judaism than Christianity. Uh, that is in the sense that there is a very strong sense of divine law and, and the revelation includes law. Actually, there's very little law in the Quran, but that is brought in through the Sunnah as the practice of the Prophet. Uh, and that's why, I mean, uh, a lot of Muslim practices are very similar to Jewish practices. I mean, we don't eat pork, you know, boys get circumcised and there are a lot of rituals about, you know, hygiene and uh, dietary laws and so on and so forth. Very similar. Uh, the the, the diff one difference is, by the way, also, when you look into the Old Testament and how the story of Moses unfolded, you there also see some battles with the pagans. You know, the book of Joshua has some texts about jihad, if you will, you know, uh, against the aggressive and hostile polytheists of the time. So there are some similarities there. One major difference, of course, is uh, Judaism doesn't have state power in the past 2000 years. So now there's the state of Israel, but Israel is not a halakhic state, although there might be groups who imagine Israel like that, but they're not the ones that really rule Israel. Uh, whereas Islam, the, the combination of religious law that is Sharia and state power has been an unbroken uh, reality until the modern era. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it's, Sharia is halakha, but with the state. <laughs> Which, which you don't, that's why, I mean, uh, stoning of adulterers is right there in the Halakha, but Jews have not been practiced that, I think, for 2,000 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, there might be Jewish scholars or uh, experts here. Uh, whereas in Islam, we have that continuity. But the question to, of course, that has been broken to a great extent in the modern era. There are secular states, you know, like my country, Turkey, became a secular republic. Even before that, there was a lot of modernization. So it's not like that we are still right there in the pre-modern era, but uh, the, the transition from a uh, armed ecclesiastical law, you know, as Kant called Judaism at the time, transition from a religious legal system with, with certain coercion into a society of free individuals 
that is not easy and that is going on, but there's a lot of turmoil. So that's why actually in my book, I said, well, there is some Islamic enlightenment actually going on since the 19th century. And this book is meant to be an intervention into this saying that, listen, this is where we got stuck. There's a theological problem here. And this is how we can rethink this. We can revive some of the early ideas that are pushed aside, but they can open up today. So uh, it is, I think, uh, on the other hand, I mean, in, in Islamic tradition, you have Sufi orders, you have, uh, you have moral teachings that don't need a state. And today there are so many Muslims living in uh, Western societies who are actually very happy that they don't live under a Sharia-based you know, Islamic state. Uh, because that would not be their share. Yeah, that would be coercing them. So, and I think, the, uh, so, or even in Bosnia, for example, Bosnian Muslims have been living in non-Muslim secular state, first the Ups, Ups, uh, Austrian, Hung Austrian Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, then Yugoslavia for 150 years at least. And they develop a civil society uh, and, and like called Riaset. So they are happy with that. So, there is not just one big block of Islamic world out there, and there's no one example of Islamic practice. But can we make this transition from a, uh, a legal tradition which relies on the state and which have coerced the rules to a free society? The answer is yes or no, 50-50. And, and, and I am trying to saying, well, let's go forward here. Right. Uh, given the current global trends toward authoritarianism, how likely is it that there will be a reopening of Muslim minds? Well, there is a growing trend towards authoritarianism for reasons not related to Islam per se, I think. Um, why did that happen? You know, social scientists are discussing this. I mean, 20 years ago, we were all hopeful and naive that there will be a, you know, end of history of a liberal democracy. I mean, I mean, some people were, but I was also more optimistic about the direction of my country, Turkey, for example. So why authoritarianism is coming up even in the West now in some established democracies? Uh, we're, we've seen things unthinkable in the US, right? In, in Washington a few months ago, I mean, Congress raided by people believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, people believe in lunatic conspiracy theories and doing some violent action that I know what it is, <laughs> you know, I, I and I, I, I know in some other countries, but we saw that. So there's no society that is actually born with inherent enlightened qualities and so on and so forth. So there's a problem. But my mission is self-defined mission is about Islam and I'm thinking the issues of Islam and, and politics in the world can co go up and down. I mean, we might have an authoritarian drag and we might have a, hopefully a better, a, a certain lessons might be taken from that. But I do believe in the value of uh, classical liberalism, if you will, the idea that the state should be limited, individuals should be free. It's not easy to sustain that, we're seeing that. Um, and I'm just dealing with the challenge that it is facing within the Muslim majority world with religious issues. Yeah, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, America has other issues that has become quite burning, I think, in the past few years. There's a very good question, um, given your story about Malaysia and the religious police. And we know from research um, that most countries on earth have some sort of religious affairs bureau and so forth. So the question is, what do countries gain by policing relig religion or regulating? So. Well, first of all, uh, first of all, religious scholars, some of them think this is the Sharia and you'll implement this. I mean, if you say, well, this makes people hypocritical, they will say, well, we'll do it better. I mean, we will, there's the idea that if you actually uh, coerce people, they will ultimately learn their right ways. I mean, Iran is another great example. I didn't touch upon Iran today too much. I mean, Iran has this policy of gozinesh, I mean, choosing people to bureaucracy, looking into their religious practice. Iran has this policy of enforcing women to wear the hijab. And, you know, there are females in Iran protesting this, especially in the past few years, bravely. Uh, the, why doesn't Ayatollah Khomeini look into this and say, well, maybe we're doing it the right, wrong way. I mean, this is a certain frame of mind, but they don't see it that way. They see this as a Western conspiracy. They see this as 
uh, a tide which has to be pushed back. Like in Malaysia, for example, I'm uh, following the events in Malaysia very closely, you know, because given my experience in the country, <clears throat> they have a ban on Christians uh, from using the word Allah in their publications. Now, this is actually one of the most absurd bans ever, I think, in the name of Islam, because Allah means just the God or God in Arabic. And Christians, Arab Christians, have been using the word Allah for centuries. In Malaysia, they got at this idea that Christians should not be able to utter the word. It's just our deity and not theirs. So it's a very kind of very interesting religious nationalism dynamic there as well. And a lot of people criticize this. I myself criticize this. Recently, the Malaysian Constitutional Court uh, actually lifted this ban. But there are Islamist parties pushing for this. Uh, it is a certain way. And I think it's the same reason why uh, some Catholics and Protestants, you know, instead of refuting the other side or having a conversation, thought that they should go to war, I mean, in the middle of the 17th century. And of course, there are political benefits behind that. There are interests as well. But there is some genuine conviction that this is what it is and it has to be done. And, and the, there is the idea that freedom, uh, individual freedom, will necessarily make society corrupt and you have to keep things in order. Uh, whereas I think lack of freedom is m making society corrupt because it's leading to a lot of pathologies, including, uh, including hypocrisy. And it doesn't allow Muslim individuals to actually develop their really faithful character. And it just creates this herd mentality. When you go get out of it, you become disoriented. Um, there's a really interesting question here that I've thought a lot about myself. What are the concrete things that non-Muslims in the West can do to help promote this reopening? First of all, there are things that uh, Western powers should not do. <laughs> uh, one is to occupy or bomb or invade or you know, intrude into Muslim countries. Uh, because one of the problems since the 19th century in the Muslim world, for people like me, has been the very fact that, on the one hand, Western countries are an example to which we can point to, saying that, you know, right, you know, liberalism is a good idea, and it's working really well in the U.S. Not so well in France, but, you know, that's another discussion with all respect to France, but, you know, I think some limitations on religious freedom there is generally a problem for me because it's brought up as, you know, you see they banned the hijab. Uh, but the, the, at the same time, the same Western powers are, not all of them, but the major, the big ones, have also been the countries that colonized uh, the Middle East, uh, that has invaded Muslim countries, that have had drone operations, and so on and so forth. So there is an understandable anger, geopolitical anger against the West. So that's why confrontations between the Muslim world and, and, and Western powers are generally very bad for any potential of development of the growth of Islamic liberalism. That's why I believe in peaceful relations as much as possible. And uh, I believe in free trade and educational exchanges and cultural uh, rapprochement and understanding between the West and Islamic societies. Uh, secondly, uh, one thing that the Western societies can do is to keep their buy of freedom high. Because one, one of the things I always face is when I make an argument that, listen, freedom is a good thing. And they will say, okay, what about this? What about that? And what about this is generally, again, with respect to France, it's France. Oh, they banned the hijab. You're saying that hijab should be, uh, I mean, women should be wearing to what they want. What about France? They're banning, banning the hijab of our sister. Isn't this liberalism a big lie? I mean. I had this conversation dozens of times in Muslim majority countries and Muslim communities and so on and so forth. I have to say, well, you know what? Actually, you know, France is not doing right there and I'm critical of there too. Or what about they, they allow cartoons of Prophet Muhammad. They, they have bans uh, about disregarding the flag and, and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, and also, uh, for example, uh, Switzerland had some referendums, you know, ban about banning minarets or banning niqabs. Those kind of things becomes the perfect what aboutism for the illiberal Muslims, saying that 
you know, this is all a big lie. They're just actually banning what they want. So we will ban what we want. And it just goes on like that. So have peaceful relations with Muslim societies, not go hawkish. Uh, and, and those uh, attacks on Muslim, Iraq war has been disastrous, for example. And uh, also uh, keep the bar high so we can keep the West as an example, not as a what about us, you know, counter example. In other words, live by, you know, our own professed constitutional values. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and something that I've noticed uh, that's quite disturbing to me is if you look at uh, the Pew studies on global restrictions on religion, the scores on the United States have gone up quite markedly over mm -hmm. the past decade, mm -hmm. both on social hostilities and on government restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, the more that we do not live by our own professed belief in conscience rights and religious freedom, we undermine any kind of case that might be made. Exactly, us. exactly. Um, one question was what responses you expect from Western Muslim traditionals to your book? And have you had those kinds of dialogues? Well, I'm having those conversations with uh, Western Muslim traditionalists, as you said, in the West. And uh, there's an interesting landscape there. I, I would actually like to see more uh, because I, I think Western Muslims generally appreciate, especially in America, appreciate the American system. Like this is a country where you can be who you are, you can wear whatever you want. The government cannot police you for that or cannot tell you, you can open your mosque, you can open your atheism temple, whatever you want. And that's a good thing. I mean, there are a lot of Muslims who generally, and I think that's why America is one of the best countries to which Muslims integrated well, I think, that freedom and, and respect to religious traditions as well. So there's a lot of things that are happening there. On the other hand, I see some, I mean, so lived practice is very interesting and valuable. On the other hand, I see some conservative Muslim scholars saying, you know what, this is good, but our values are different. And back in Pakistan, we will keep up with those. Actually, I don't want to give a name here, but I, uh, during the Hagia Sophia uh, discussions, uh, you know, the Hagia Sophia church mosque was reconverted back to a mosque by the Turkish government in uh, last summer in July. And I, I was critical of that. And because I said, well, if you do this, this is kind of Muslim supremacism. So what, 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 then what do we say to Hindu supremacists who convert the IOTA uh, you know, mosque into uh, a you know, Hindu temple? the Babri Mosque, sorry, into a temple. And, uh, and one prominent Muslim scholar said, well, listen, we like the Western values here. This is nice, but it's their standards. We're happy with this, but Islam has our own standards. And according to our standards, Islam is supreme. It will always prevail. I mean, he defended Islamic supremacism or Muslim supremacism and saying, and I think that is not fair. Uh, but I think that will be overcome maybe in a generation because it's becoming hard to say we use freedom, but actually we won't give it to others. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that discussion needs to be frankly done. I'm trying to do as much as I can sometimes on social media. Uh, but I think this is one stage. And I think the next generation of Muslims will say, well, listen, if liberal democracy is a good thing and we appreciate that, uh, we cannot cheer up for bureaucratic uh, oppression uh, in our homelands. All right. Um, uh, another question was kind of an extended discussion of, of um, reconciling reason and revelation, reason and scripture. Um, and, uh, and so this, the person asked, which one to choose if mind or reason contradicts with religious order or even Quranic verses? Mm -hmm. If we should choose re reason, why do we even need religion? Mm -hmm. uh, what can religion grant us that conscience or reason can't. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very profound meditation on this kind of yeah. timeless issue. It's not yeah. an just in Islam, obviously. That's a very a timeless issue, very big issue in classical Islam between the philosopher or the philosophers and, and the, uh, let's say, theologians. First of all, I should say reason has its limits. And uh, I think Religion tells us about metaphysics, which we cannot detect through reason. I don't know through reason what's going to happen after life, right? Uh, 
so I think, and actually some defenders of reason in classical Islam went a bit too far in trying to figure out metaphysics as well. Uh, so it's like science. I mean, science is good to, you know, live in the natural world and utilize it and make sense of it and so on and so forth. But science is not going to tell you what is beyond this or if there is anything beyond this. Plus, uh, reason, uh, so that's one thing, metaphysics. Second, you don't know how to worship God. You don't know, I mean, religion gives you rituals and the way to connect to God. And so these are, these certainly come from. Uh, religion also teaches you about morality too and ethics too. But I think there's an interesting thing there. To me, reason is a reminder. The Quran defines itself as zikr, which is a reminder. And Khalid Abu Fadl, a great scholar I respect, and I quoted him often in my book, he says, the Quran is a reminder for people to do good and justice, which the Quran doesn't always define even what it is. Because through reason, we can understand, well, you know what? Even with my conscience, I understand I shouldn't be unfair to my neighbor, but there is some other voice coming to me. I do it, do it. It's okay, you know, right? So religion is the additional reminder saying no don't do that do what is right but if i uh, deny reason in understanding what is right re religion can become a blind obedience to a literalist tradition which is exactly what is happening in the muslim mm -hmm. uh, in some corners of the muslim world today uh, that's why i regarding ethics ethics is the most important issue here and actually in Islam, the theological roadblock I'm talking about is, by the way, this. Does reason, uh, there were two approaches in Islam on this. According to one approach uh, defended by Mutezala, and you know, some of them, some, uh, some more mainstream Sunnis agree with that, like the Maturidis. The Sharia, Islamic law, divine commandments indicate us what is right and wrong teach us about what is right and wrong, which is objectively out there. So even if there was no religion, we would know murder or theft is wrong. Uh, according to the other view, divine command theory, to bring a philosophical term here, the other view said, no, murder or theft is wrong only because God said so. And if God said, said something different, everything would be different. So religion became the only basis for moral value in that Asharite tradition. And that's that's the main issue actually I'm struggling with in, in through the chapters of my book. Uh, so I believe that's why I emphasize God gave us revelation and religion, but also reason and religion independently can establish moral value. Now, once we take that step, we try to reconcile these two values and we, we connect our religious tradition with universal values of humanity, as I call it, uh, but not every theology allows that. It is not an accident that Enlightenment thinkers were actually exactly dealing with these issues. When you read Leibniz and Kant and uh, Locke too, I mean, they were dealing with this issue of, and it's not an accident that Locke had a book on the reasonableness of Christianity. Uh, and I think these are exactly the issues we're having in Islam today, and we should have more. And one reason I wrote the book. All right. Well, one final question uh, from a, a namesake, uh, Mustafa. Um, when we look up to Muslim countries, we see the governments often using a religion to promote patriotism or to control the, the public. What do you think of the role of, in a sense, employing Islam or Islamic symbols to promote uh, patriotism or support for the government and so forth? Uh, a doctrine of God and guns, <laughs> if, you, if you will. Yes, we have that as well in the Muslim world. And I think it is, you know, in other worlds and civilizations as well. India, certainly there's a strong Hindutva element there and, and that is Hinduism combined with nationalism and very actually assertive and sometimes militant. Uh, we have that. And actually, by the way, that is a part of the problem. I mean, the, the problem of illiberalism, if I, if I put it, coercion or authoritarianism, sometimes comes directly from religious texts, but sometimes comes from nationalism. And sometimes you have an infusion of these two. In Turkey, my country, big time. I mean, uh, Turkey today, I mean, the dominant mood is Turkish Islam, the same thing. And we're just all God is behind us and on our army and, and, and on all that and so on and so forth. Uh, I think the switch we have to do there is 
to move beyond religious tribalism to religious universalism, as I would put it. Like, why is God always behind us, right? Like, why, why is God always empowering us and oh, the other guys are the bad ones? I mean, are, aren't we, in that sense, using God a little bit as our, you know, flag, as our motto, as our, uh, you know, there's a famous uh, expression in Islam, like putting Quran to your, on, on top of your swords or spears, which happened in the first during civil war. I mean, one side put Quran on their spears, saying God is with us, basically, right? Why is God is with you and not us? I mean, Abraham Lincoln has a great quote on that. I mean, I, I don't, probably you're familiar. He says, he says, I'm not sure whether God is on our side. I'm wondering whether we are on his side. So I think uh, elevating God a bit, a bit above our tribal, political, cultural ambitions and, and, and our struggles to a source of universal values to which we should try to subscribe is I think a better approach. And, and yes, uh, there's a lot of examples of religious nationalism combined with Islamism. I mean, Pakistan's aggression on Bangladesh in the 70s, a brutal one, was where you exactly had that. It was nationalism and Islam combined. And now Bangladesh is uh, recalling those uh, bad eras uh, these days. Um, I wanted to um, address uh, an issue of vocabulary. Uh, issue of, sorry? An issue of vocabulary of, because uh, some years ago, the Rand Corporation did a study called Building Moderate Muslim Networks. Gets to the issue of what can sympathetic voices in the West do to sort of promote liberalism or enlightened values and so forth. <clears throat> but I always thought that there was a problem with that sort of vocabulary. Like, um, do I wanna be known as a moderate Catholic? What is that? Exactly, mm -hmm. right? And, or, or, or is it liberal? Well, liberalism has all kinds of connotations um, mm -hmm. in the modern world um, or reform voices, right? We, we often speak of Islamic reform voices. Well, what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? So when you, what vocabulary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you spoke about classical liberalism, the liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the, the Islamic kind of uh, opening that you want to see, how do you characterize it? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And actually that's one of the roadblocks, you know, because a lot of Muslims have this, I don't know, not a lot of Muslims, but some Muslims have this defensiveness that they are willing to change us. And of course we will not change because, and they are the colonialists by the way, and they have a terrible history too, by the way. So, that is another layer of complication here, which I try to do. First of all, let me tell you something. Western powers or Russia or China may want to see this or that Islamic group become more powerful for their own geostrategic interests. And by the way, this is not always the liberals or the modernists. Wahhabism has a big credit you know, in uh, Western colonial circles in the past century. I mean, when you look at some early British writings in the uh, early 20th century, they were saying, you know, the Ottomans are the corrupt caliphate. We need an Arab caliph and that should be the Wahhabi caliph. And there was some sympathy for Wahhabism as a Protestant movement and so on and so forth. Uh, also, I mean, U.S. supported pretty hardcore Salafis against the, against the Russian empire in Afghanistan in, in 1980. So it changes. And after 9-11, because, you know, Westerners saw this, you know, militant Al-Qaeda terrorism, they said, oh, yo, of course, we want the, of course, moderate Muslims and so on and so forth. Now, these things happen. My, as a Muslim, I'm really not interested in that. I mean, it is there. And by the way, it's only normal that, of course, when some, I mean, when I look into a, a, when I look into Christian world, I prefer moderate Christians in the sense that the Christians who respect our other faiths, I don't believe, I don't want to live with people like the Lord's Resistance Army in Africa. If you're, I mean, everybody who look at a religious tradition from outside will, of course, will like to see more moderate views if that the other views are threatening itself. But that's not the reason why we have to have these conversations. And we were having these conversations even before the West was interested in all this. I mean, 19th century Ottoman liberals, now Kemal or... Uh, new Ottomans, I mean, these are the people that, or Muhammad Abdul, they did it, they looked into the West and they saw a lot of problems in the Muslim world. They began to think of liberal values, not to please the Westerners, because they realized 
there is something wrong here. I mean, we, we have to we have to think certain uh, we have to think uh, we have to change certain things. Like John Locke didn't throw liberalism to please another civilization. He saw a problem within Christianity. Yes. Christians were killing each other because the other side is Protestant or Catholic or Puritan or this and that or Percy. He said, let's just not persecute each other, right? I mean, it was for the sake of that society, for the sake of the civilization. Of course, at the time, Christianity wasn't threatened by an outside civilization that much. But you know what's interesting? There are some uh, conspiracy theories about Ottomans conspiring within Christendom in, in 16th century Europe. I mean, for example, when you, uh, here's one example, when Unitarianism appeared in uh, uh, Christendom in the, in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation, it was depicted as an Ottoman conspiracy to change Christians and so on and so forth. Unitarian. Yes, I mean, and, and some Unitarians, by the way, escaped to the Ottoman Empire to save themselves from being persecuted as, or beheaded uh, as, as heretics, you know, in Germany, you know, Germany was not liberal <laughs> in, in the 17th century or neither England. So, I mean, it is only normal that civilizations will, I mean, an example, if I look into Hinduism today, I will really want Hindutva, Hindutva, sorry, Hindutva, to be not the dominant voice in Hinduism. I would prefer Hindu liberals to have more and the, the liberals will be there, will be people who are Hindus, but who have respect to Muslims and other religions. Now, though, this doesn't mean that those people are there to serve me or, so I think we should be able to uh, overcome this, what they want from us sort mm -hmm. of obsession. Uh, and we should look into what do we really have to do for our own religious tradition, our civilization and what do we present to the world? I mean, what, what are our values? We should have honest uh, conversation about that. I'd like to uh, bring our own distinguished Josh Landis uh, into the discussion here. Uh, and so Josh, uh, our, our expert- I'd, I'd love to ask a question. Do you, thank you for uh, an exciting talk, which is, couldn't be more, more timely. Um, I'm going to use an example. It's a question about whether one needs to separate church and state or whether there can be a liberal Muslim state. And I want to use the example of Syria, where I wrote an article on Syrian textbooks about 10, a little more than 10 years ago, before the revolution, the uprising. And in the ninth grade textbook, it said that on a section with a subtitle of pagans and unbelievers and atheists. It said, how should we treat pagans and atheists? And it said the only way to treat them was either to convert them or to kill them in simple language like this. And of course, you ask, you know, I immediately ask myself, how does an Alawite regime, which is heterodox, and in which the rulers, Bashar al-Assad and his father, are seen by mainstream uh, fundamental, not even fundamentalist, but mainstream Islamic scholars to be outside the realm of Islam and to be pagans because they deify Ali. How could they have allowed this to be in the textbooks? And of course, I think the answer is because they didn't expect um, anybody to act on it because legally Alawites are declared Muslims by themselves who, who made the law. And therefore the law of the land is that they are Muslims. Even though the majority opinion is that they're not, mm -hmm. um, that they fall outside and they're hulu, they're extremists. And this, today, I, I just went with a student over the textbooks today in Syria, and they've erased all of this. But they don't substitute it with John Locke. You know, you would think that they would come up with some theory of how Muslims should get along with each other, but they don't. They just are quiet because there is no theory for them to put into this textbook. Or if there is, they don't know it. And so they don't, there's no mention of the word Shia. There's no mention of the word Alawite. There's no mention of the word Druze. There's nothing about sectarianism. The only thing about sectarianism in the books is that, is to blame um, others for sectarianism by saying that God did not mean, this is a supremacy of Islam thing that you brought up, which is God, 
had to introduce revelation in steps. And so first you had Judaism, and then they went astray. And of course, you get the new covenant with the Christians. They don't put it in those terms, but you get the new revelation with Christians. And then everybody was supposed to convert to Christianity, but of course some didn't because they were arrogant. And then Islam came and everybody was supposed to convert to Islam, but of course some Christians and some Druze did not because they were arrogant. And they, which is exactly what Christians think about Jews. They were supposed to convert when Jesus came and they refused and they lost the covenant. And they were going to go to hell, I suppose, you know, traditionally in medieval thought because they refused to accept. And so that that's embedded in the textbooks. That's the way they explain the hierarchy and what went wrong and why there are still Christians and Jews running around the world and sectarians of various kinds. And how do you reconcile a worldview that's based on that historical vision of revelation? which is common to the Christian world. It's no different here. You know, my students will say, well, you can only get to God through Jesus alone, which means that all the other religions, mm -hmm. and certainly Judaism has to be abrogated, mm -hmm. right? Because it comes later. Mm -hmm. And how do you, you know, how do you get to a liberal Islam without just separating church and state mm -hmm. and then letting religious people fight it out mm -hmm. in, in the churches? but keeping the political space um, un, unchurched. Thank you, Joshua. These are great observations and, and great uh, questions. Now, first of all, let me, uh, I love one thing you said. I mean, the alternative in Syria to the, let's say, conservative, even radical Islamist language is not John Locke. So, and that is, I think, one that, I mean, in Iran, the alternative to the Shia clergy was not exactly the liberal democracy. The Shah was an autocrat. And even in Turkey, I mean, Kemalism, yes, they moved to democracy to some extent, but it was never fully like something like a liberal democracy. And um, maybe in Tunisia now, we are seeing the glimpses of that. I mean, the thing is, in one of my arguments is that one unfortunate uh, trajectory we had in the Muslim world is that our modernizers were generally autocratic or secularism that not always emphasize freedom. Uh, some people say that is the only thing possible in any liberal context, but I think, you know, there were alternatives. So anyway, this is, and uh, that, that's just a side observation. Coming to your main question. Uh, well, I have a chapter, uh, the final chapter of Luke on the, the theology of tolerance. Um, there are very interesting passages in the Quran, like Surat al-Ma'idah, um, 95, I guess, but I'll check. Uh, that God revealed, if God wanted, he would have made us one community, but he actually gave us dif different sharias, different traditions, so we can actually uh, compete with each other in doing good. There is another verse in the Quran which says, not just Muslims, but Jews, Christians, Sabians, and Sabians were another monotheistic, but you know, undefined community at the time, will actually be saved if they believe in God and do good things, the good deeds. So actually, there is a very interesting ecumenical narrative in the Quran, which have been put aside <laughs> by our religious uh, tradition. Uh, they have been either abrogated by other verses or been, their meaning has been limited uh, because ultimately, because 12 centuries ago, uh, it didn't make sense to say everybody can be saved, but still come to our religion. Well, why would we come to your religion, right? I mean, you should have something that is different. All else will go to heaven. I mean, all else. So Christians did this for a very long time, right? I mean, Ellen knows this. There is no salvation outside of the church. Uh, Catholicism has thought this doctrine for centuries. Ultimately, people come to realize that it is actually not a service to faith because it looks so self-righteous and it depicts God as such a tribal God that he only saves us, people who are born in this part of the world and so on and so forth. So I believe in Islam, we have a, we need a conversation about salvation as well. And that is the last chapter of my book is about that. And I show how pluralist salvation views were there in the beginning, but the more exclusivist views became more dominant. 
because that was what everybody was doing at the time. The world was not very liberal. Nobody was trying to be think that way, uh, to say that uh, if you don't join us, you'll go to hell. Plus, in Islam, there is a salvation only in our religion argument. Plus, salvation is only in our sect argument as well. Uh, so it's not, it's also, as you said, I mean, uh, sectarianism. I mean, if you ask hardcore Sunnis, you know, they will not be very uh, sympathetic to the Shiites and their place in, in, in the, and they will call them even Murtad and so on and so forth. Again, that's a very extreme Wahhabi Salafi situation. But, uh, and I'm trying to show that the, the urge behind this is really not piety because it is self-righteousness. I mean, it is like, to, uh, for example, there is this Hadith, I mean, I mean, uh, let's say, perpetrated hadith. I don't really, I'm not very convinced about its authenticity given its text, which says, my ummah will be divided into 72 sects and all of them will go to uh, hell except one, the saved sect, Furqa al Najia. So that's a classical hadith. Now, I, in the book, show that classical Islamic sects quoted this hadith, adding a note at the end saying that that saved sect is, of course, ours. <laughs> So maybe there was no such hadith because we needed to create this because it was a time of sectarianism. And when these texts were being written, by the way, there was a war between the Ottomans and Safavids and it was actually a Sunni Shia war. Or before that, there was a Fatimids. And this. So there's a lot of, when we look into history, history of religion, we should also know that the, who are the heretics, you know, in that day and age? And what was their political spiel? When you look at Ghazali and his... Uh, his arguments about clandestine apostasy and so on and so forth, you see it has something to do with the Selchuks and their political ambitions. And Omid Safi has a good book about that, actually, I would recommend, uh, which will allow us to de uh, desanctify our religious tradition to some extent and to understand that there were a lot of things at play and the self-righteousness there was maybe not really righteousness. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and yes, in Islam, we need to have that discussion. It's about matter of, I mean, first of all, you can believe that people, you can tolerate people even if you think they will go to hell. But I think that creates a certain mindset. And, uh, and I think in Islam, there are, uh, there are tools to actually have a more ecumenical view. And in that sense, actually, Islam is, you don't find that in the New Testament or, I mean, you find that in the Quran to say that Jews and Christians and Sabians, which is undefined monotheists, you know, will be saved. Of course, what about atheists and what about people who don't have faith? Uh, I have arguments about that <laughs> because it, the, the, one thing I emphasize in the last chapter of my book about tolerance is that when the Quran is speaking about unbelievers, it is speaking about the people in Mecca who were not just polytheists, but who were also trying to kill Prophet Muhammad. So it's not speaking about some uh, guy, at the, an atheist in San Francisco because he's an atheist, because he's convinced by Richard Dawkins, honestly convinced. So the Quran is speaking about people, a certain group of people. Similarly, when the Quran is speaking about Jews, it is speaking about a certain three tribes in, 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 in Medina, and they had certain you know, uh, tensions with there. So understanding the scripture in its context and seeing the more ecumenical view that, that was there, but that was not amplified by the tradition is, I think, the path to uh, Islamic uh, doctrine towards tolerance. Well, we uh, uh, thank you um, for this splendid presentation, Mustafa Akhil. And uh, we, uh, we have reached our uh, 4.30 time. I, I did want to offer my own just personal reflection, which is that I think that in, the, in our global era, one of the findings of vast empirical research is that the marriage with power corrupts religion and uh, produces authoritarianism and despotism. Uh, and you know, we've had philosophers who've made those arguments, theologians. We now have vast empirical data that in fact, that is the case. And I have found that passage, the Surah 5, verse 48, that, you, that you've cited, I've seen that as, in a way, a, a great wisdom, that had God willed, he would have made us one religion, one people, but he made us many. And so our job is not to arm ourselves with political power, 
but to vie one with another in virtue and in civil society. And I think that's a vision that all of us in a sense can embrace. And I thank you for providing this tremendous guidance and for this inspiring work. Thank you so much, Ellen. And, and by the way, the beautiful verse you quoted, uh, 548, also says, compete with each other doing good, which means everybody can do good. Right. So it's not just Muslims or it's every religious community. And I would say secular people because they have genuine convictions too, can do good, so compete with each other. So that is a message in the Quran as well. Uh, and I don't see it as an accident that those messages didn't define the imperial policy of the Umayyads who were trying to conquer places and you know establish an empire like the Byzantines or Sassanids were doing at the time. And I don't believe that as a Muslim, my loyalty should be to that tradition that took in that context. It should be loyal to my loyalties to the more um, noble ideas that I do see in the Quran in, in verses like that, that you want, that the one you quoted. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you all for participating. Uh, this will be posted, I believe, on the Center for Media Studies uh, Facebook. And uh, we'll look forward to further conversation. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you, Ellen. It was my pleasure. Thank you. All right.